morning is the lesson from Acts appointed for this sixth Sunday of Easter, from Acts chapter 9. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha in Greek. Her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room, and they got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. There are many, many different customs in different churches, different faiths, when it comes to memorializing one who has been deceased. One of the traditions in the Lutheran church is that the funeral does not include a eulogy. It's a tradition, and it's one that has good reason. Because the purpose of a eulogy is to tell how wonderful this person was in their life, all the good things that they did. The word eulogy comes from Greek, and it means high praise. It's giving high praise to this person who has died, and remembering all of the wonderful things that they have done. And the reason in the Lutheran tradition eulogies are not part of the service is that we want the focus not to be on high praise on a person, but high praise to God. To the God who loved that person and redeemed them and gave them the gift of faith, preserved them, cared for them, and then gave them the gift of heaven. High praise to our God. And so the focus of a Christian funeral service, a Christian memorial service, is always on God and his word. The promises that he made to the deceased and kept, the promises that he makes to the living and keeps. Now, there might be a place for for a eulogy type of thing, and and, and if it's asked for by the family, can, can someone get up and say a few words about that loved one? A Lutheran pastor will typically allow that, but but after the service is over, after the blessing. And maybe it would be, maybe not even at the service, but maybe at the, at the meal where you have a chance to tell stories and, and share what that person meant to you. Because we always want that focus to be on Jesus. Even in a funeral service. When it comes time for your funeral, what will be your eulogy? If, if your family asks, can we say a few words about our loved one? What will they say about you? What high praise will be given to you on that day? How will you be remembered? What legacy will you leave? We have a funeral scene in our lesson before us here this morning. And this is a section of scripture that I'm guessing there's some of you who've never heard this before. And maybe if you have, it's been a long time, unless you just recently read through the book of Acts. But we're here at a funeral. You see, this woman has died, and we're at a visitation where the people are gathered around her dead body, and they're weeping and they're crying over the loss of someone that they have loved. And, and we learn some things about this woman who's given two names, Tabitha and Dorcas, depending on which language you're going from. 
What we learn about her is she was always doing good and helping the poor. In the original language, it says she was full of good works. Her life was full of good works, doing things for other people and helping those who were less fortunate, those in need. And we get an example of who some of those people she helped who were in need because we see them here at her, funeral, at, at her visitation. It's widows. People who had, women who had lost their husbands, who in this time were kind of just pushed aside by society, forgotten about. And very often they were poor because they didn't have any source of income. And this woman, Tabitha, made it her mission to make clothes for them. To provide for them. We know very, very little about Tabitha. All we know is what is right here in these few verses. She does not come up anywhere else in the New Testament. She actually doesn't speak a single word in the New Testament. We don't know really anything about her. Was she a widow herself? We don't know. All we know is that she had a life that was full of good works, helping those in need, including those widows who needed help. And you can tell how much she was loved. These widows have gathered, and they're weeping, and they're mourning over the loss of their friend, someone who had helped them greatly. It seems that Peter, the Apostle Peter, doesn't even know who she is. That seems to be the, the sense of what's here. So it, Tabitha was not doing these things. Her life wasn't full of good works and helping the poor to make a name for herself in the church. It was just something she did. It was what her life was all about. And you get the why. You get the why in this little section of why her life was full of good works, why she was helping the poor, why it wasn't about recognition for her or glory for her in any way. It says right at the beginning that she was a disciple. This is a believer in the Lord Jesus. This is someone who knew and came to believe what her Savior Jesus had done for her that her sins were forgiven, that heaven was her home, and her life became all about good works. Showing love in action. It's clear from this very little that we know about Tabitha that she knew God's love for her and that she took to heart what we heard in our other lessons from John. John's first letter and John's gospel. That she knew how loved she was and her life was now about showing love, living love, acts of love. That's what Tabitha's life had become about. Because she knew what her God had done for her. She saw her life as a way to show that love to her God and to her fellow Christians. Tabitha's legacy seemed to be love. Love she had known, love she showed. And that's what she was remembered for as those widows gathered around at her visitation. They had pieces of her love in their hands, clothes she had made for them, labors of her love for them and for her God. How about you? What legacy will you leave? What will you be remembered for? If a eulogy is given for you, what will it say? What do you want it to say? How successful you were in this life? Your title that you got at work? Your achievements, your accomplishments? 
that what you want to be remembered for? How about how busy you were? How many things you did all the time? Is that what you want to be remembered for? How about as a faithful church attender? Is that what you want to be remembered for? They always sat in that pew every single Sunday. Is that what you want to be remembered for? Is that the legacy that you want to leave? Now, I'm not saying any of those things are bad or wrong. It's okay to have achievements and accomplishments and success in this life. It's okay to be busy and doing a lot of things with the time that you've been given. It is wonderful, of course, yes, to be a faithful church attender. Don't get me wrong. But remember what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians? Let me remind you. He said that if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. A little later he says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Dear Christian, you have known God's love. You've experienced God's love. You look at the cross and you see God's love on full display for you. One who takes your place. One who takes your punishment. One who did what you could not. One who took what you deserved. You see God's love in the flesh, in Jesus Christ, a perfect Savior for you. You've seen God's love. You know God's love. Look into a tomb that is empty. A tomb that proves that God loves you right now and forever. A love that spans into eternity. A love that he has had for you from eternity. As Jesus said in our gospel lesson, I chose you. He's chosen you from before the creation of the world to be his very own. He brought you to faith, to know him as your savior in the waters of your baptism or through that, that hearing of the gospel and that promise that you are his forever. That empty tomb is the proof that God's love for you never ends, never fails. It shows in word and, both, and in action. You know that love You've experienced that love. You've been fed in that love continually through the gospel, through the sacrament. And now, what is your life about? What do I hope you want to be remembered for? If your family wants to give a eulogy, what will it be filled with? What legacy will you leave? I hope and pray that it's one of love. God's love for you that you know and you grow in. God's love for you that you just could not help but share in every single way. That that is what your life is all about. And you get to show that in so many different ways, don't you? You get to show that in so many different places, don't you? You get to show that in your marriage you get to live it with your children and your grandchildren. You get to live it in your workplace, in your neighborhood, with your enemies. You get to live that love that you have first been shown in kindness and compassion and gentleness and forgiveness. In what you say and what you do. That is what this life is about. You have been so loved. And now we get to go in love.
You know, the old term for visitation is wake. And if you know the, the, the background of that, it goes way back, why it's called awake. You see, there would be people who would stay with the body of a, someone who had died overnight to make sure that they really were dead. And they didn't wake up. And we didn't bury someone who was really alive. So that's where that word wake comes from. To that, that watch overnight to make sure that they don't wake up. They really are deceased. You know, in a sense, Tabitha's visitation was more of a wake. She was dead. There's no doubt about that. This is not some sort of sleight of hand ruse that, that Peter was able to perform to fool people. No, it says that she was dead. Her body had been washed and prepared for burial. But on this day, death would not win. Because the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, gives the Apostle Peter the ability to raise the dead. And maybe this even surprised him. You know, Peter's been able to do some miracles with the power of Jesus. But this is the first time that he raises someone from the dead. But not by his power, but by that that the Lord Jesus had given to him. And she wakes up. And she gets up. And there had to have been rejoicing. There had to have been hugs and more tears of, of now of happiness. Proof for all those who believe. Proof for those who didn't yet believe that God has power even over death. Tabitha gets to be a living illustration of that. And you kind of wonder, what, what, uh, what did Tabitha then do for the rest of her life after she died again and went back to heaven? My guess, we're not told, but my guess is she went back to making clothes. She went back to using her time and her abilities and her resources to show love to those in need. She continued to be a disciple of the risen Jesus. That her life was again filled with that, full of good works, because she had known that love. I, I, I'm not real sure that the same is going to happen to you at, at your visitation or your funeral, that somehow you're going to be raised from the dead. I, I, I don't think that's probably going to be the case. I can't say that for sure, but likely not. You get something better. Do you know that? You get something way better. You get to be forever in the presence of God. You get to live in the light of his love forever. And no more struggles with the sinful flesh here. No more, no more kind of love, sort of love. You get to be in that love of God forever in heaven. And that truth, that certainty, that future that the resurrection assures you of gives your life meaning. That I want my life to be a legacy of love. Love that I have known, love that someday I'll get to live in fully, and love that I get to show. You know, Jesus spoke some words a couple chapters before our gospel lesson from John 15. It's the same discourse, it's from John 13. And you know what he says there? He says that, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's by this that everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How does the world know who we are? How does the world know who we follow and what's important to us and what matters to us? By our love. Our love for each other. Our love both in word and in action. May that be the legacy that you want to live. A life lived in the love of God. A life lived showing that love. God bless you in that. Amen. Now may God himself, the